Welcome to Obey Your Strengths with Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, Kathy Kirsten. Today I'm speaking with the CEO and co-founder of FreshBooks, Mr. Mike McDermott. He's also the author of Breaking the Time Barrier, a free downloadable book from FreshBooks.com. This book was reviewed by Tim Ferriss, in which he said, People constantly ask me how I can get a four-hour work week with a service business. This story is the short answer. I hope you'll download Breaking the Time Barrier. There's a lot to offer. Mike, thanks so much for joining our podcast today. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Great to be here. I'm thrilled. And what I haven't told you in this setup process of getting you to today is that I am a FreshBooks customer this year. (laughs) I made the leap from another software... I won't say what the name is, but you could purchase it at Costco, (laughs) which is one of my favorite places to shop. And about five years ago, I purchased a software program to do the accounting of my business. And I hated every minute of working with that product. And then I started shopping around at the end of last year. And I went on Facebook and I said, hey, people, tell me what you small business consultants are using for accounting. And overwhelmingly, I heard FreshBooks. So I took the free trial and I am what almost six months in to being a very happy customer Mike thank you so much for fresh books well thank you I'm I'm glad you surround yourself with such wonderful people (laughs) uh, (laughs) uh, no that's great I'm delighted I I did not know that and I'm I'm so pleased Uh, oh yes I will take (laughs) <laughs> Take feature requests and uh, room for improvement after the call. How about that? Oh, well, Should good. Spend time I, on actually, that. I don't have any yet. I've, um, I have gotten some customer service help through the chat, through Fresh Books. And let me tell you, that's some fanatical service. It was really, really great and quick and easy to do business with. And then whenever I sort of lagged on responding to her, um, she sent me an email like, are you still there? Did, did I solve your problem? I'm like, yes, you did. I mean, she covered so many bases. So anyway, kudos to you <laughs> for providing us uh, solopreneurs with a great accounting system. Uh, I love it. What's the tagline? Tell us the tagline of FreshBooks. Well, it's uh, it's an interesting one. We uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I might go off the script with our, our marketing organization right now, but uh, painless billing is where we started out. And so what we decided was, hey, you know, we're going to build an accounting software that's not for everyone. So we don't really work with restaurants or retail companies because uh, they don't have clients that are repeat business and long-term relationships. And so we built accounting software for, for, for companies that do. And so, um, you know, if you invoice, you need FreshBooks. That's the way to think about it. And it's just ridiculously easy to use invoicing accounting software in the cloud. About 20 million people since we you know, used it since we started. We had a... Uh, and then you're based out of San Antonio, so we were uh, we were a longtime customer of Rackspace, a, a big San Antonio uh, success story. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit about the firm. Oh, that's so awesome! And you know, I remember hearing Fresh Books as a Rackspace customer back in 2006 when I was working at Rackspace, and I just assumed I was too small to use Fresh Books in my business, which. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> and no yeah, one is, oh, right? We, as long as you send an invoice, you could be a FreshBooks customer. Awesome. Yeah, many of our, most of our customers have no employees. And that's who we built it for. We recognize that, uh, you know, two things. One, hey, the software is way too hard to use. And, and most accounting software, I'd say all accounting software, the outside of FreshBooks, is really built for the accountant, not the owner. Mm. And so we focused on the owner and said, make it really easy. And then we said, hey, these people are busy. They're competent. Uh, why don't we just make sure we have, you know, world-class customer service and, and, and little known fact, Kathy, I don't think that's that service. I'm so glad that was your experience. We work really hard at it. And we, uh, I know Rackspace was also a big customer service firm. Uh, we, we beat you all out on, on some, uh, some service stuff at the studios and stuff like that. We're, we're, we're world-class too. <laughs> nice. Uh, and inspired in many ways by, uh, by, by the Rackers out there. So, well, um, I, uh, I love it. Well, thank you very much. It's fun to be your customer. Okay. Well, let's talk about strengths. <laughs> Mike, I know that um, you have utilized strengths through the years as you've, as you've built your business, and I can't wait to learn about your top five and how it has influenced your journey as an entrepreneur and how you have built your business. So with that, will you, would you mind starting us out with telling us what your top five strengths finder themes are and how they describe you? Sure. Um, so I'll give a little, uh, when I took this um, 
this test, um, you know, they would sort of, I guess let's call it a test, uh, really like filled the thing out. Yes. <laughs> I was, uh, I had just founded FreshBooks. I'd never worked for anybody else. I was working in my parents' basement. I'd been a sort of small business owner and was becoming what I would call an entrepreneur, somebody who's going to build a, a business to scale. And, um, you know, I always thought they may have changed. And I'll say, I just, you know, I was rereading the definitions that I have here today. And, uh, you know, maybe they haven't changed as much as I thought they would, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. Anyhow, um, so, so focus is my first one. Um, and uh, responsibility is my second. Mm-hmm. Restorative is my third. Ideation is my fourth. And input is my fifth. And uh, I certainly have elements of all these in here. Uh, I don't know if some of my six, seven, and eights would be the, in the top five now, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that, those are my five. How does focus manifest itself in you? To give us some examples of what we would see you doing with focus. Well, well, as I say, I kind of pulled out some some more recent, um, you know, like a, the proper definitions of the strengths. But I'll tell you how I've internalized it. Okay. Okay. And how I I think about focus as a strength, and you can tell me, you know, how hopelessly wrong I am or, or what have you. But <laughs> for me, I, I think of focus as an innate sense of priority. Oh, that's a great. I'm good about great knowing what's describe. next. Um, and I, and, and if it's, you know, if I'm working on stuff that's not that, I, I drop the other stuff and, and I will encourage other people to do the same. <laughs> uh, and so that is, uh, and so I'm always very interested in, you know, are we working on the right thing at the right time for the right reason? And I think that's my focus. Strength. An innate sense of priority. That's a, that's a great way to describe focus. Okay. Well, I think the other strengths we're going, are going to come out as you tell us your startup story. Would you mind kind of taking us back to your parents' garage, your parents' basement, <laughs> and you were building? Were you building uh, this software th- by yourself? I I built it um, initially for myself and the business I was running. So I was running a small design firm, um, helping small business owners you know, build their websites. We had a specialty in, in sort of marketing, so we were kind of an internet marketing firm. Uh, mixing sort of design and web development, these kinds of things. And um, I saved over an invoice one day and said, there's got to be a better way to do this. I had studied business in school, um, but I it didn't love the accounting part. And I looked and was familiar with the software that was out there for other people. And I said, geez, there just has to be a better way to do this. And so I built my own thing you know, to build my clients. And that's how we got started. And it was really just for myself at the start. And then we turned it into something other people could start up and, and use. And back then, that just wasn't that common. And this was all, you know, sort of early days of like kind of the, the web applications really, really mm-hmm. sort of taking over and then mobile apps and the rest of it. Um, so that was the, you know, that was the, the beginnings of it. Um, and uh, yeah, because we're Canadian, it's not garages, it's too cold. Uh, it was the basement. <laughs> Thank you. See, in San Antonio, we don't have basements. <laughs> You'd have to start up in a garage if you wanted to start up in someone's <laughs> spare space. Okay, yeah. so you're in the basement. Yeah, and then you tell me how far. That was the that was like kind of the, the initial moment. And then we ended up there for three and a half years. Um, and then in you know, lots of trials and tribulations from, from there till here, if you will. But we were in the basement for three and a half years. Uh, you know, we only, after two years of doing this thing, you know, kind of mostly the part-time side project, uh, you know, we had 10 customers paying us, you know, $10 a month. So we're making a hundred dollars a month. We're sort of three founders. And, um, you know, and then three years later, we were, you know, over a thousand customers and, and, uh, you know, a team of six people. And, and we started, uh, you know, sort of growing from there and we're about, you know, 300 people hiring about 50 even now, believe it or not. So, um, you know, we're kind of in another, another big growth leg, which is exciting. Along the way, as you were building, were there ever decision points where your focus or responsibility strengths helped you stay true to your original vision? Or was there a vision that you were trying to stay to, uh, you know, pure yeah. to? Great story for that one. I probably have a pretty good story for, for restorative as well. And I can probably find some for the rest. But let, let's go to focus and responsibility mm-hmm. since you asked. Um, there was a moment as we were building the business, we had a big opportunity come our way. And it's long enough now that we're well past the NDAs, but it was actually Wells Fargo. And they wanted us to be there. They were like, listen, we're going to sell invoices to our customers. You know, if you just get 3% of the small business customers we have, you're going to have like a million clients. Life is going to be great. 
at this time, when they first called us, we were still in my parents' basement. We were just about to move out, but we were really early. Uh, and we were doing everything we could to make it not obvious that we were at the end of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and, yeah, but we had a great business. And anyways, we went down, and um, uh, we actually won the contract. Okay, so and this was this was new for us. We hadn't pitched into these folks, and they, they were great. I really liked the team there, by the way. They were great. You know, they were wonderful to work with, and they chose us. And um, they came back and said, you know, here's the deal. It's a great contract. You're all set. And, you know, I looked at it, and I really did not know what to do. And if you think about a decision like this, you know, let's call us. We have maybe 1,500 customers, and we're making you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month. Like, we're not really much of a business yet. And this could be just a total game changer. Um, but it would also mean we would have this one really big customer. Mm. And when you have a really big customer, they have a lot of influence. And also, banks are not really known for moving quickly. Um, and so we would have a large customer that was probably also doubling as like an anchor for innovation. And you want to have influence over what we build and where our limited resources would go. So it would be harder for us to realize our, our vision. And so I ended up with the, um, you know, the responsibility for making the decision for the business. And uh, that's, I guess it kind of goes in the chair. And I, I kind of, um, I kind of, I, I had a hard time deciding. Uh, and what I ended up doing was, I guess, sort of copying out in a way. And I went back to them and said, if, if you pay us 10 times as much, we'll do it. And um, they said, no, thank you. And I said, great. And we went back to you know, what we were doing. And I, I maintain if we had taken that deal, we would not be here today. Um, and so it was uh, really a combination of you know, staying focused with pursuing our vision and also a responsibility to our end customers because I think they would have been poorly served mm -hmm. um, relative to if we stayed independent, uh, if we had done that deal. Um, so, so those were, those were really core factors, uh, that, you know, inspired me to go back and say, well, you know, everyone's got a number, uh, <laughs> so, yes, right. Uh, that, that, that's how I, uh, sort of managed through, uh, through, through did your partners, issue. did your partners disagree at that point or were you all sort of um, on the same page? I think everyone for whatever reason was like, it's your decision. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, here's our input, right? And I think that's probably why people trust you to make decisions, is because they know you're gonna hear them out, listen to them. Um, but uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, that was that was the approach we took. And you know, it was one part of negotiation. It, you know, with that amount of capital, maybe we could have made it all work, right? Um, but if we didn't have it, it was wasn't going to. What a great story. That resonates with me. Uh, in so many ways that there was risk there that you would not only have that anchor to innovation <laughs> uh, weighing you down, but also that you were concerned about the other clients, not just this huge whopper um, coming in. Wow. Great story. Thank you, Mike. So tell us a little bit about the other. Well, actually, I want to know, but first, when did StrengthsFinder come into play? Do you recall when you took your the assessment and learned about your top five strengths? Yeah, I would have known my strengths when we were going through this uh, negotiation, if you will. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so that was around that time. So pr pretty early in the business, it was in the basement days that uh, that that we did it. Okay, so you brought, so you had uh, uh, quite a bit of education in business. You were already a consultant building websites. You. Uh, are a problem solver, obviously, that restorative piece was coming through in just the creation of this business for FreshBooks, which wasn't called FreshBooks at the time, right? It, it had a different name? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And then you're bringing it together. So what did you realize you needed in support uh, through partnership with others? Who did you bring in? Well, and what did okay, they contribute? I might, I might play it a little, a little bit um, differently uh, to to get back to this. And yeah, we can see how the strengths are are sort of complementary in the end. Um, you know, since there's so many people, uh, we're probably listening to us thinking about running their own business, that kind of thing, or starting them up, or trying to get it going right now. Um, you know, I I started out and I was I was you know, sort of writing the software, trying to figure out how to market it. You know, kind of doing everything. 
Um, along the way, I picked up two co-founders, uh, one of whom started taking core responsibility for Raven Software, another one who took core responsibility for kind of, um, I guess, managing the business, getting all the stuff done, everything from bookkeeping to reporting to also writing software. Just, you know, all of us had our hands in, in, in everything to some extent. Mm-hmm. You know, these, these areas of, of specialty started to emerge. Um, and then we ended up reading this book called The e uh, which is I strongly recommend for anyone who's, who's getting going in sort of startup land. And it gets you thinking about, um, you know, there's really three roles you need, which is, uh, you know, the technician to do the doing. There's the, the manager to kind of keep the trains on time and get the projects going and, you know, document stuff or whatever it is. And, and then, uh, you know, sort of the entrepreneur who's kind of probably out in front of a little of everybody, either dragging and trying to say, why aren't we there yet? Um, and this is where we need to go. And, and why aren't we there yet? Uh, and so it turned out we, um, I, I, I'm sort of that, that last character, the entrepreneur. So sort of more on the, I guess, the, what is the product and, and how are we going to market it side? My co-founder Levi was very much, you know, organizing things, keeping the trains running on time. Um, as the, the team is scaled out. And then uh, Joe, uh, the third founder, was more on the technical side, building building the offering and, uh, you know, sort of great at that. And it turned out, like, so those are these three roles, the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician are from, from the book, The E-Myth. It turned out the three of us actually fit very nicely into each one of those. Okay, and so then if we go to strength, like Levi's strengths were all around that, like, that manager person, you know, very much, uh, you know, very good with people and, and developing them and getting lots of stuff done. You know, high in achiever, right? Just wakes up every day, like, you know, and he literally was, you know, he just carried this pad around with a to do list on it. It was just like constantly putting things out and crossing them off, right? That's that's a good day for Levi when he crosses stuff off the list. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was a bit of a night. Funnily enough, I don't know if Joe did the thing with us uh, at the time because he was sort of part time. So I don't know what his ranks were, but uh, Levi was a great compliment to me. Oh. Okay. Right, still it. And, and so his leading with achiever and arranger really got things done. Uh, Levi. Now, so I have Levi's top five achiever, arranger, developer, maximizer, and analytical. And I thought it's interesting how you both have quite a bit of um, fuel in the executing domain to get things done, but you both come at the world from different views and that, you know, of course, I don't know what your six through 10 are, right, Mike? So who knows, but um, you do, obviously, but he's got maximizer, which really shoots for taking good to great and your restorative probably enjoys solving problems. So you're willing to go look for things that are broken and bring them back to life again. So I just think that restorative maximizer is, um, dynamic is really unique in partnerships because one person wants to take something that's already working and make it even better. And then the restorative person wants to take something that's broken and bring it back to life. So they're just two different ways of looking at problems. And I think it's pretty neat and well-rounded if you have both of them in the partnership. So that's kind of cool. It proved to be a great relationship and, and sort of still is, as I say. It is today, this day. So Levi's still with the organization? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay, so Mike, will you tell me um, a little bit about how your leadership challenge has changed from those startup days to to today, where you're running a successful and growing organization? Uh, what has changed for you as the CEO? Well, uh, there's been a, a great need to work on behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> tell me more, uh, Mike. Uh, my 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 focus strength uh, means I know what we should do next. But as you have more people joining the organization, um, you know they, they need time and space to kind of figure that out for themselves as well. And as a founder, that can just make you impatient at times. And so um, I had a lot of things running through me for a long time. I kind of made it to 100 people, and like a lot of the decisions in the organization were flowing through me, like a huge percentage, like way too high a percentage. Okay, and so. I had to go on a bit of a leadership journey to, you know, step back from that uh, and create the space for, for other people to, you know, sort of go in the right direction um, and find their, you know, apply their own focus strength to figure out how to prioritize, you know, towards that end goal. 
Uh, and so I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, you know, I think sometimes your strengths can become like your weaknesses as well. And, um, you know, my drive to get there faster because isn't it obvious that's what we need to do, mm-hmm. uh, needs to be parked at times so that other people, um, you know, can find their own path there, build their own momentum, which is ultimately, uh, you know, a way to, to go faster, longer term. As they say, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And, um, you know, that focus strength can be, uh, you know, it has a, a dark side where it can be applied, uh, you know, to my mind, um, uh, in a way that's, uh, you know, less scalable. So that, that's been sort of my leadership, part of my leadership journey is like, you know, um, create space, you know, offer direction and create space. Right. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, you know, kind of will always be, and that's part of, you know, just leading larger and larger teams. I've heard that from so many folks that are in the similar situations that you are startup founders who then have hundred or hundreds of employees and, and beyond where they've talked about throttling the strengths that helped them be successful in the early days, uh, throttling them back a, a little bit or just making sure that they're intentional about using them so that they don't create organizational instability or chaos um, at some points. And, and most of those stories I'm thinking of have to do with Activator, right? Where perhaps a uh, found up starter, sorry, startup founder would activate too much. But I can see how your focus could cause some a temptation inside you to say, gosh, this is where we need to be going. Uh, this is the priority at this point. So let's keep moving. That's really unique. Um, what about responsibility? I, what I, one thing I admire about FreshBooks, and you can see it from everything that every move that you make uh, from the corporate culture, man, I'm watching your blog. I've, I've, as a customer now, I'm getting more into the center of what's happening at FreshBooks and how customer focused you are in helping us build our businesses as your clients. Uh, so you're building a really great service culture, which we talked about, but does that come from your belief system and responsibility in, in what you're doing and, and how has that changed through the years? I, I mean, I'm, the short answer is I think very much so. Um, we, um, for what it's worth, I, I think we did one thing that has proven to be, you know, and this is classic with cultures. Like it's like this, you know, it's, it's obviously a collection of things, but if you know, I had to put everything down in our service culture to one thing, it's everyone spends their first month in customer service at FreshBooks, no matter what your role is. And um, so that's, you know, whether you're, the CFO or the, you know, or somebody from the support team or what have you, you spend your first month there. And the idea is you learn our product, our customer, and our culture. Um, and lots of good stuff just happens downstream with that as a foundation. I, I think, you know, in the earliest days in the basement and what have you, uh, it was actually like three months because <laughs> we didn't get as many, we didn't get as many tickets. Uh, be part of it, uh, <laughs> but um, there was really an obsession around the quality of service, and um, you know that that is. I think that persists, uh, and again, I think it's another strength that has a, a dark side, right? Like you really want to adhere to this very high standard um, for everybody, and it, and it's hard. Uh, the good news is the team has built itself in a way that they have scaled that very successfully over the years. Um, but I, I do think it comes from that kernel of, you know, sort of treat others as you would wish to be treated. And, um, you know, we've built that up sort of, uh, you know, piece by piece and, and rebuilt and changed parts of it over the years. But, you know, everyone in the organization is, you know, still very grounded in, in the customer. And, and it also gives you, you know, one of the nice things about that is it gives you a very strong sense of purpose. Right? So for me, you know, like deep within us, many of us have a real... Um, you know, we get fulfillment from serving others. And when you spend time with our customers and, and seeing the difference you can make for them, just sometimes by answering a couple of questions, maybe because it was quickly, maybe because it was competently, maybe both, um, and the effect it has on people and how sort of grateful they are to get back to their day, you, you know, you, you know you're making a difference. And so I think that's, that's a gift that's been baked into the business as well. I love how you have a tactic there, the, the onboarding for the first month is in the front lines. That has to be a really (laughs) 
painful investment at some points if you're growing, right? And you need that instead of having the software developer in, I mean, in onboarding, you need them to be in their seat working towards where they're going. I mean, you're hiring people because you're growing, right? And you're hiring people to help build and maintain uh, your business. So, wow, that's a really awesome investment and in such a great role model for saying this is what matters most because in the long run everyone will feel more connected to the customer because of that rackspace has similar onboarding practices too um, i don't know if they are have been able to scale it i left when they were about five thousand employees but that is a a great investment on the side of sense of purpose is there an element of I used to think about this, and I think about this with responsibility all the time, how you want to be dependable, so therefore you are dependable, and you want people to be dependable as well. So you have an expectation for yourself and for others if you carry responsibility in your top five strengths. Uh, is there a strong relationship culture at FreshBooks for each other, for the employees amongst each other? Um, I, I think, you know, sometimes with these questions, I'm, I, I feel like I'm the, the last person to ask to get a, you know, an a, appropriate answer. And the reason is uh, I'm too close to the problem and I haven't really worked anywhere else. So I don't have as much to compare it to. Uh, but, but I will say, you know, we, um, there's a good chance the answer is yes. Uh, and, you know, I think that would be the kind of thing that shows up in, we, we take part in the Great Places to Work survey, which is like Google and everybody. It's like the Fortune 500 yes. best places to work. So, so we, we participate in this sub-1,000 employee company, and we, we've been in the, the top 10 for like the last four or five years um, in that, you know, less than 1,000 employee category. We were number one in 2015, number four in 2016. Wow. Uh, seven in 2017 and that kind of thing. And so, um, so I, and my guess is, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing that people like uh, and feel good about um, and it brings purpose to their work. And, you know, I think it is a very supportive culture. And so maybe that's the best way to frame it. That's what people say is like, I can stop anybody at any time and they're going to help me. Right. Um, which is, you know, like that doesn't come for free. Like some places it's like your desk is over there. Maybe your manager will drop by in a week and tell you what you're supposed to be doing, right? That's that's not how we roll. Uh, you know, for us, it's a, it's a very we try to really smooth out that process and have you feel a part of something day one. Um, so, uh, you know, if that kind of gets at it, uh, sure, I I, I, um, I guess so. I don't, I, but I, as I say, I have a hard time kind of answering those questions sometimes. Oh, well, I love your transparency. I think it. I think you're. Um... That's endearing to me that you feel removed from it because I'm thinking you are probably one of the biggest inspirers of this culture, uh, the way that you see the world and the way that you treat all of your employees and the way that you express yourself through your own strengths lens of responsibility, right? That you are creating that. But that's really neat, Mike. I know that those lists beyond, that is a job just to get on the list uh, to apply for the list that's a lot of work i used to handle it at rackspace and so congratulations that's a big deal to be in the top 10 that's a really big deal thank you yeah no i love it because it's the employee is not the company that determines the the score at the end of the day and that's why i like that one so much i heard a story once about your early days and how you surrounded yourself with now i'm calling them trusted advisors i don't know if you call them mentors or not, or what you would call them. But I think about a personal board of directors, you had surrounded yourself with people who knew things that you perhaps didn't know, or, or people you admired, and you wanted to pull in to learn from them to help you grow as a leader. Can you tell me some stories about uh, how you found the right advisors to, to grow as a CEO? Yeah, so I think this was something I did sort of naturally without really knowing it. Um, we were building this company in Toronto in really the mid 2000s, early 2000s, and there was really no tech scene here at all. And, and frankly, the notion of there really being a tech industry was like something you kind of read about in Wired magazine in 2001. But you know, bubble burst there, and there was you know no reason to believe it was coming back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I would not say I grew up especially connected to any kind of tech community. And, uh, and frankly, since I'd never worked in a large organization or anything else at all, like I, I just, I had this great knowledge that I was just hugely gapped on what I was doing, 
especially with where I needed to go. And so as I would move through the world and, you know, whether it was go to a conference or a meetup or, um, you know, who knows what, I would, um, I'd meet people. And sometimes I'd meet somebody who um, I felt could be helpful in some way. And usually these people, I had to have like some kind of a personal affinity with them. Like I felt like we were not a values match. Um, I I would just, you know, it was a non-starter. But, you know, a lot of successful people, uh, who've had great progress in their, you know, their careers and the things that they've done, um, they often do have this, uh, you know, a pretty strong value set. So more often than not, I, you know, I would, I would quite enjoy these folks as I met them. And so I started kind of collecting advisors. I didn't know I was doing it, um, but, but I would follow up. I'd build some kind of rapport and then ask them if I could follow up. And then by golly, I would follow up. And when I followed up, I would ask them questions. Right? I, I would kind of lay myself bare and say, like, I don't know. And here's what I don't know. <laughs> Do you know anything about this and can you help me? And I found across a variety of disciplines that I, I learned after a while that nobody had all the answers. And so you actually needed to have, you know, a broad uh, cross section of people to get a bunch of your answers done. And, and that's, you know, that then I would just sort of shamelessly send them a note and, you know, invariably, um, and I think it was because I was just kind of candid and, and demonstrated I did not know, but I was hungry to learn and I believe they could, you know, I could benefit from them. People were very generous uh, with me in their time and, um, you know, and for which I'm forever grateful because I don't think I will be here. And then, you know, that kind of went on and on and on. And then you start out growing some of your advisors, which is like a weird phenomenon, hard to get your head around. And then you wind up in a place where there aren't a ton of answers necessarily anymore. Uh, and you just gotta, you know, run the business. <laughs> but, uh, that was, you know, that, that, that's been the better journey for the better part of the last 15 years uh, for this guy. Well, can you, you know, I heard you say something on an interview you have done on a, a different podcast that talked about an overnight success and that you don't describe the FreshBooks story as an overnight success because it's taken you 15 years to build it, right? And that perhaps we might have an obsession, which I totally agree with, that we might have an, an obsession with overnight successes. I attribute that to your strong strengths of stick to that you have in your top five of keeping going. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, you know, the word I would use to, to capture that is just perseverance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess if, if you're saying that is evident in my top strengths, I would say, you know, perseverance is probably like, you know, a secret ingredient here, right? It's, it's, it's been huge um, uh, for, for us just because of various times and various challenges that were either ongoing um, or really just took long-term sustained application to, to, to get through. Um, so yeah, no, that's been, that's been a big part of it. And I think it's at the heart of most entrepreneurial stories, right? Whether they're an overnight success, which usually has some like 10 year, you know, precursor story to it. If it's truly an overnight success, uh, or it's an overnight success where someone's been working on it for 10 years and everyone kind of finds out about it in year 10 and 11, then it becomes a success. Like, you know, th- those are the only two kinds of overnight success stories I really believe in. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's talk about scaling a little bit. Can we talk about scaling your business? I think that's one challenge that lots of entrepreneurs have. Tell us, uh, you know, some l- some rules that you've learned or lessons you've learned on how to scale your business. Um but keep remain true to your your center and your core, which for you folks is you know, customer focus. Yeah, well, that every uh, problem is a people problem. Every solution is a people solution. It really really does come down to people. And, and you know, as a startup founder, you know, I went along for a long time. I had lots of decisions running through me, and I had tried to bring in people who I thought you know uh, were were the answer. And these are great people, so I don't say any of this to disparage any of them. Um, and they came from great firms like, you know, Microsoft or whatever. Uh, and, and they are great leaders in, in their own right. But what I found was until I hired my first, what I'll call them a true executive, um, I didn't understand what I was really looking for. Like there was just another level. And that's what I needed. And then I became very addicted and we hired like four or five of them in the next sort of 12 to 18 months. Um, 
but but that is the key to scaling. Okay, right? it, it is, uh, and and you got to do it at the right time and build up to that and those kind of things. And you got to make sure you know that they're true to your values fit. And you know we had a pretty good track record around that. You know, I had one person who was probably on the cusp for a little longer than I should have supported them for, but um, you know, by and large, it, it, it it's it's you know it really is around those people and their capabilities. Um, because everything gets easy if you have great people. Like that's the only way to do business is scale. Full stop. So when you say that the the real um, the, their capabilities, what tell us what that is? It a talent thing? Is it talent capabilities? Is it skills? Is it experience? How, kind of unpack that for us. What does that mean? Well, I think it starts with leadership. Frankly, like are they leadership capable? You know, can they, can they, you know, they know how to look into the future, you know, sort of direct folks and, um, you know, coach them. Uh, What I look for are like strategic operators. That's the way I like to think about it. So it's one thing to be strategic. You know, it's another thing to operate, right? So you can be strategic and be like, I know exactly what we need to do and being capable of leading people to do it. Or you can be a great operator that's like, I'm a great operator, lots of good stuff's happening, but you know, I just don't have much in the way of foresight. Right. So people are motivated, they're getting stuff done, but they're probably not, you know, back to my focus strength, where they could be making three steps, they're probably making one. Um, and so a strategic operator is you have both of those things. Whatever function you're in, um, you're you're a strategic, you know, person who can and look out there, but you're also a great leader. I think you need both of those. And so the leadership pieces, I think, are consistent across the roles. Um, but the um, – and by the way, there's many forms of leadership, so just understand that. Like, there's different styles. You've got to be very open to that. I would say I've tried to be over the years very open to various styles, but mm-hmm. like a high bar on what excellence is. And then on the, you know, the, the, the sort of the – I guess it's the, uh, the strategic side, I think that's where you need some experience in your discipline. Um, because we're counting on you to make the right strategic choices in your domain for the business, right? In concert with everybody else's. Um, and uh, so you need to have probably hands-on experience that you built up over the years and have seen, you know, the patterns really over and over again uh, and have the ability to know situationally, this is our situation, therefore that is what we should be doing. Anyways, that, that's a rough way of thinking about it. I love it. I think it's wonderful. I work with so many teams uh, who are challenged because they don't have strategic operators. And when you can see the missing piece, um, sometimes so clearly that, but it, it's hard. So it's easy to hire people. It's hard to let them go. Uh, and I think that paying attention to the talent pays off the the innate talents because I see, yeah, experience it absolutely helps, but you need to see the world in a way that says there's a future and I need to get there and I'm going to, I'm in control of painting it versus just letting it happen to you. And that's what I think about strategic thinking themes, right? They're pulling us forward to the what ifs, what could be. And they're matched up with execution of let's now go get there. We know how to get there and you need both. And I think that's really unique. Uh, That's awesome. So is there anything secret is there a secret sauce to um, working at Fresh Books? And I'm asking that because I think about my rack space days where we had culture fit and you had to be a racker. Is there like, like in racker, that meant that they were focused on customer service and there were tricks we would do like in the hiring process to say, are you focused on the customer? Are you focused on serving? Is there something similar in the Fresh Books culture that you have as a coined term around talent and culture fit? So we have um, a set of strengths, or sorry, a set of values. Okay. Okay. And, and, and it's that share, those shared values that make you a fresh cooker. Okay. And then I would say, you know, because there's some disciplines where, um, well, I want you to be aware of the customer and to, you know, to care about serving others, you know, your day to day and software development it probably is more around problem solving and as a byproduct that you help people. Um, it, it can be either, but what I'm getting at is, Hey, the prime in that discipline is probably around a love of solving problems. Okay. Yeah. And to live our values. Whereas if you're in customer service, it's like, 
hey, you got to live our values, but you know, do you get energy from helping people? Is that what gets you up in the, in the morning? Mm-hmm. Um, which are, you know, so, so I think every discipline has a slightly different version. We don't actually hire uh, really QA folks anymore, but I would always look for, do you like breaking things? Like, is that what gives you energy? Right, like finding holes and stuff, because that's a different strength, and you know, invariably. So, so we'd ask questions around this stuff and learn. Oh yeah, like you, you bias naturally to you know the kind of um, you know, I don't know, like call it passion or what have you that's going to be relevant to loving your domain for a long time. I love it. Okay, so let's talk about breaking the time barrier. Bre- this is a book that you wrote and you offer it for free on your website. And it's a great book. I've read it and I've actually already passed it along to someone I've been coaching who's a consultant who has not broken the time barrier. <laughs> Tell us about breaking the time barrier and why in the world did you write this book, Mike? Well, um, the book is, you know, sort of a, a distillation of some things I learned when I was running my business before Fresh Books. And I went on this little journey that said, you know, I started out kind of a brochure where you can buy this kind of stuff for me. And then I started, you know, sort of running projects that took a longer lead. And I wound up in a place where I would say, hey, listen, you know, what is your problem? How much is it worth to you? Can I help you solve it? And if I do, will you pay me a percentage of that value I create? Um, and, uh, and, and so what I find is there's a lot of people out there that um, think of themselves, you know, like they're, they're effectively billing by the hour is one way to think about it. Or they have some service and they just charge a fixed fee for it. And that's always the case. And it's always been that way. And it's kind of this very, um, I would say it's the starting place for how to think about your, your value as a, a consultant or a small business owner. Um, and the, the purpose of breaking the time barrier is to help people go on a journey and divorce themselves and what they charge from the hour and instead help them see it and frame it for their customers as actually the value they bring. Cause, cause what people sometimes just don't understand is people are not buying you for your time that you can put against something. They're buying you to solve some problem that they have full stop. Uh, and as soon as you really understand that, and my job is actually to solve the problem, I actually get paid for doing that. And then how much is it worth? It's a very different um, you know, conversation as it pertains to pricing your services, as it pertains to engaging your customers, and frankly, partnering with them, as opposed to kind of being in an adversarial place where it's like, well, you want my hour, and this is how much it costs, and I want to work more hours, and you want me to work fewer, so it's cheaper for you, which is not a great place to work. So, so this is more gets addressed. It's a 45-minute read. It's in a fable story, if you can stomach that, um, but uh, it's pretty short, and if it doesn't help you evolve your mindset with regards to what you charge your clients and why, um, I don't know, it's free. So I, I can't give you a money yet guarantee, but uh, I will tell you that uh, <laughs> when we put it out there, we actually asked people to, if they felt it was valuable, uh, pay us. And they paid us thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, really? Because, I saw uh, that note yeah. about <laughs> about uh, making a donation, basically. And that's impressive. Some people paid us hundreds of dollars to read a free book. Wow. Well, that's because it brought like, value. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that, that, exactly. Exactly. So they were proving, hey, the thing was worth more than free. We, we just wanted to get it out there because uh, they thought it'd be valuable for folks. Well, I think it is valuable. And I wish that I would have had it in 2013 because I felt very er- in my in my early days of consulting. I, f- I loved what I do. I, it comes easily to me. It's part of my strengths to do strengths coaching and training and working with teams. And I didn't really see how I was providing any value until one day one of my mentors woke me up and said, wait a minute, you're, mo- you're bringing more than just a training. Like think about what you're doing for these folks and you're changing their culture. Oh, then I, you know, things started clicking and I think your resource is great. I think it's fantastic and I want to evangelize it. Right. So breaking the time barrier can be downloaded from freshbooks.com. If you are a consultant and you're having a hard time understanding your own pricing structure and just the mindset of what value you bring, it helps bring clarity to, to that for yourself in that fable way that I love that Pat Lencioni uses. I mean, I love fables. I love business fables. So I like that strategy. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, it's uh, it, again that purpose is the mindset shift. That's why we wrote it, um, and fables are super helpful for that. Yeah, they, they certainly are. Well, I've had a lot of your time today, Mike. I want to let you go. Before I do, though, I always ask my guests one question if we haven't uncovered it yet. But if you were to think about uh, your strengths, and and Graham Weston, the, the uh, chairman of Rackspace for the years that I was working there, uh, he helped me understand that people need to obey their strengths. They need to feed their strengths. The strengths have needs that must be met. So if you think about your strengths, are there ever any times where you have to obey your strengths? You must you must feed the strength or, or live out those strengths. Well, I think that's increasingly the job. Um, and so for me, what I've had to do over the years is, is basically for years, it was like every quarter I had to redefine my role and now it's probably every six months. Maybe it's going to be a yearish sort of soon. Um, and, uh, and and you know what I try to be mindful of in there is yeah, what what are your strengths? And and my strengths are around seeing around corners, you know, talking with customers and and seeing you know connecting the dots that other people don't see, uh, and then you know coming back and saying we need to do this in, in this sort of order. And I'm actually um, you know for what's worth. Um, right now, we've brought in like a president kind of character who's going to take on more day-to-day responsibility around the business so I can spend more time on my strengths, which is exciting. And it's been a, a great, um, you know, we're kind of just getting going with it. But uh, um, I, I'm excited about that. And it, it feels very different and scary as a new role for me. Mm-hmm. That's probably the biggest change of all the ones I've run over the years. But, uh, but I'm also excited because I think it very much plays to my strengths. Well, thanks so much for for sharing your stories with us today. And we wish you the best of luck and keep on keeping on with FreshBooks. I'm a happy customer. I appreciate what you do. Obey Your Strengths is produced by Geek Day Media in association with Game Day Media Enterprises. Executive produced by Lorenzo Gomez, John Garcia, and Michael Largent. To learn more about Kathy Kirsten, visit her website, kathykirsten.com. That's K-A-T-H-Y-K-E-R-S-T-E-N.com.